Welcome to Truth For Life Weekend. Today we have come to the end of a special three-part message called Citizenship, where we've been discussing how our identity as citizens of heaven ought to influence our lives on earth. It's a challenging perspective that completely reshapes our priorities and our passions. And we begin today with prayer. Father, as we come to the Bible once again, and as we prepare to gather around your table and in obedience to the command of Christ, break bread together and proclaim his death until he comes, we ask that you will bless this meditation on your word to our hearts as individuals and as a church family for the glory of your name and for the good of your people, we ask it. Amen. Well, verse 17 of Philippians chapter 3, and Paul writes, "'Brothers, join in imitating me, and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. For many of whom I've often told you and now tell you even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction, their God is their belly, and they glory in their shame with minds.'" set on earthly things. And then comes this great contrast. But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. Therefore, my brothers whom I love and long for my joy and crown, Stand firm thus in the Lord, my beloved. We ended quoting uh, from Philippians and actually from this passage. And we, in turning to this most familiar uh, verse, are brought face to face with one of the main and the plain things of the Christian life. We are essentially brought face to face with what we might actually regard as a forgotten essential. And that is the promise of the return of the Lord Jesus Christ in power and in glory, and the expectation that is for the believer on account of all that Christ has accomplished in his death and in his resurrection. Where these matters become the focus for people, uh, they are often clouded by speculation, and by controversy. And it is a great shame, and it is distinctly unhelpful. And so what I want to do is point out three very straightforward things. And in doing so, begin in this way. I didn't learn—well, I learned quite a bit. I don't remember much of what I learned in taking economics at school. I had two years of it in my final two years of high school. Uh, We had a very eccentric teacher who used to walk around on his heels, but he he taught us a number of the essential laws, uh, and the only one that I really had any recollection of at all was the law of diminishing returns, Uh, the point at which the level of profit or benefit or return from something uh, becomes less than the amount of money expended or the amount of effort expended in order to get that return. He taught us that by saying, you know, if you were very interested in having an apple, you might be prepared to pay, you know, a half a crown for an apple. But once you ate the apple, you probably wouldn't pay half a crown for the second one. Uh, You may, but it's unlikely, and so on. And so I made these great, you know, uh, economic uh, discoveries uh, at a a very early age. But I, I understood the principle that, you know, eventually, if you have a surfeit of things, Uh, the benefit that accrues to you diminishes with time. And that is essentially what is true of life lived outside of Jesus Christ. Because the routine of life, even the successes of life, uh, the benefits that are enjoyed in the earthly pilgrimage, have diminishing returns. Essentially, we're forced to ask the question, what's left when there's nothing left to look forward to. And the Christian stands 
in distinct contrast to that. That is the point that Paul makes so magnificently here when he contrasts those whose minds are set on earthly things with those whose minds are set on our citizenship in heaven. Um, Philip's paraphrase of this I found wonderfully helpful. Uh, this, is, this is how he translates 20. But we are citizens of heaven. Our outlook goes beyond this world to the hopeful expectation of the Savior who will come from heaven, the Lord Jesus Christ. He will change these wretched bodies of ours so that they resemble his own glorious body by that power of his, which makes him the master of everything that is. Uh, three simple observations. First of all, uh, the description that is given here of the believer. It's a very helpful description, isn't it? We are, he says, the citizens of heaven, the citizens of heaven. This is a picture that the people in Philippi could surely understand, because although they lived in Philippi, it was an outpost of Rome. They were citizens of Rome living elsewhere. Their names would have been on the rolls and the records in Rome, the capital. Their dress, language, laws, protection, the emperor that they worshipped, all pointed to the reality of their citizenship. And so Paul is using their understanding of these things to drive home this wonderfully helpful picture. This, he says, is really a picture of what it means to be a Christian. For as a Christian, our names are inscribed in heaven's register. Our lives are governed by heaven's laws. And no matter how much we enjoy the benefits of life down here, the best is always still to be for the Christian. And he is pointing these believers, many of whose circumstances would have been not, uh, not a little daunting. He's pointing them to the reality of this by, first of all, making sure that they understand that the description fits them. Many of their friends, many of their family members, uh, would, or, would already have died and gone. And now they'd see themselves citizens on the earth. And where are they headed? It's a long time, isn't it, for many of us since we sang songs like, This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. I often wonder why it is, not just because the melody seems a little quaint, but I wonder whether we've just lost sight of the fact that this is a transient, ephemeral passage of time that we become so complacent, so settled, so happy, so fulfilled, that really the prospect of anything else doesn't appeal to us at all. But they sang, this world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. My treasure is laid up somewhere beyond the blue. And the angels beckon me from heaven's open door. And I can't be at home in this world anymore. Now, that is the statement of someone whose citizenship is in heaven a citizenship that is secured by the new birth, and a citizenship that is displayed in our new behavior. That is why we go back in time and we realize that the heroes in the, the Hall of Fame, if you like, in Hebrews 11, are such a help to us. And what was it about Abraham that caused him to live as he did, to trust God as he did? Well, the writer tells us he was looking to a city whose builder and maker is God. How was it that these individuals endured such trials in the pilgrimage of their lives? Well, they were all still living by faith when they died. You and I will never be dying in faith if we are not now living in faith. We will never be welcomed into a heavenly city unless we have become members of Christ's kingdom by grace through faith. And the invitation of the communion service is not a wholesale invitation to the man in the street to walk in and to try, by means of taking religious symbols, make something of himself or make something of herself, but rather it is an invitation from Christ himself to those who are citizens of heaven by his grace to prepare for the day when they see him face to face. Well, that's the description. And then secondly, he is giving to us here uh, this expectation, this expectation. Uh, we are awaiting a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. We eagerly 
await a Savior. The the reason the eagerly is there is because it catches uh, the essence of this waiting, uh, this waiting. As I read it again this afternoon, I I, I had a a, a huge um, flashback to the routine Sunday at my home in suburban Glasgow when I was small, before I was the age of nine. And from the bay window of our home, I could see all the way to the end of the street. And the end of the street, there was a main road, and it was on that main road that the buses uh, came and went. My grandparents uh, had no uh, personal mode of transportation, only public transportation. Uh, We were not in the position that we are today, uh, texting each other every 15 seconds to announce where we are. And so, we would never know—I would never know—if on a Sunday afternoon my grandparents would come and visit us. And I would always hope that they would, because that would mean that I would have the benefit of their company, and I might be able to dodge evening church. And uh, I don't say that to my credit. I say it to my shame now. But the fact is, I would watch, and, and I knew when I saw a bus pass the end of our street, I knew how long it took for them to walk from the bus stop, which was about 300 yards to the left of me. And so, I could pretty well count it down. And I would wait and wait and wait, and if the time elapsed, I knew they were not on that bus. But I would look and see what time it was. There's still a chance. I would wait for another bus. And oh, the tremendous joy when I saw them appearing around the corner. I wasn't casually interested in their appearing. I was eagerly longing for their appearing. That is the verb that is supplied here. A trivial illustration. You can multiply it many times over yourself. But Phillips gets it right, doesn't he? He says, here is the distinguishing feature in terms of our expectation. Our outlook, says Phillips, goes beyond this world to the hopeful expectation of the Savior who will come from heaven. It's an amazing reality, and it's hard to conceive. There is a reservation in the Bible in every place concerning heaven. Even the language that is used in descriptive terms, is pretty well locked somewhere in the earlier centuries. And it's hard for us to translate these things. If you've lived, as I did, in the big city in Glasgow, and you've lived in all the stir and the mess of the city, uh, you may be surprised uh, to go out into the beauty of the countryside and see uh, little birds happily engaged in all of the freedom that is provided for them in that context. And you may think to yourself, well, what a shame for these little birds. What a shame for these birds. They don't have a cage to live in. Now, why would a child think that? Because the child's understanding would be governed by the life they knew, not by the assessment of life beyond that which they know. When we think in terms of heaven, and I guess many of us do sparingly, but when we think in terms of heaven, our confidence in heaven lies not in our ability to describe it or even to conceive it, but our confidence in heaven lies in the total reliability of the one who has promised it to us. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. That is it. And essentially, that is all of it. That's a bit like a child falling asleep. Will you stay with me until the light goes out? Yes. Well, how will I know when I'm asleep? Because I've promised. That is it in its entirety, and that is the expectation of the Christian. And it leads, finally, to the transformation that is described here. The transformation is uh, is magnificent, isn't it? 
is beyond our ability to conceive. He's going to transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body. In other words, he's going to take these bodies of ours that are exposed to the curse of sin, and as a result of the fact that they've been exposed to the curse of sin, that is manifest in sickness and in weakness and eventually and in death. But that is not the end story, because we're going to appear in a new transformed likeness. Uh, Again, Paul in 1 Corinthians makes much of this. You can read it for your benefit. We shall bear the likeness of the man from heaven. 1 John 3, we, when we see him, we shall be like him. Well, how will this possibly be? If that is God's purpose, on what basis may we have the conviction? On the strength of his power. And this, you see, is why when we think in terms of our Christian apologetic, the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ lies at the very heart of things. That is why, if you remember Francis Schaeffer in the 60s, uh, he, he began almost on every occasion in dialogue with agnostic and atheistic students and philosophers. He began with the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He began by addressing the question, is Jesus Christ the person he claimed to be? On what basis do we have conviction that Jesus has triumphed over sin and death and the grave? If he then is that person and has triumphed in that way, then we have a basis for our confidence, we have a ground for our expectation, and we may be assured of the transformation that has to come. Two quotes, one from Calvin and uh, one from an old Scottish minister. I found this in in the Institutes uh, very challenging. Calvin writes, How tell me, can what Jesus describes as a cause of rejoicing produce in us only sorrow and dread? If that is how we feel, why do we still boast of being his disciples? So let us come to our senses, and however much our greedy, blind, and stupid flesh may protest, let us steadfastly look to our Lord's coming as a truly happy event, one which we do not merely desire, but for which we even groan and sigh. For he will come as our Redeemer, and having rescued us from this pit of all woe and misery, he will bring us to his glorious inheritance. Quite a thought— I'm not sure I'm there. I want to be there. I'm not sure I'm there. You must decide for yourself. I find this immensely challenging as well. Uh, The record of Robert the Bruce, uh, who was an old Scottish minister, he died in 1631. And uh, history records that he ate an egg for breakfast on the day of his death. He enjoyed it so much that he asked his daughter Martha to prepare him another one. Then, hesitating, he said, No, there's no need. My master is calling me. Bring, rather, the Bible. Turn to the eighth chapter of Romans, and put my finger on the words, I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor demons nor and so on is able to separate me from the love of God which is in Jesus Christ my Lord. Martha did this. Is my finger on it? he asked. He was blind. Being assured it was, he turned to her and said, Now God be with you, my dear daughter. I have breakfasted with you, but I shall have supper with my Lord Jesus Christ this night. Soon Bruce was dead and immediately passed into the presence of the Lord Jesus. So when you go out tomorrow, we go out tomorrow and we run into our friends who are saying, this is good, we have the holiday, and it's wonderful. And then you see them again the following Monday or whatever it is, and they say, oh dear, you know, we're looking forward to it so much. I don't know what we're looking forward to now. You say to them, do you feel as though you went to the fair and the merry-go-round is not so much fun, and so on? You say to them, do you have any knowledge of how much God loves you in Jesus? Do you know that God loves you so much that he sent his Son to die for you? Do you know that when he died for you, he bore your sins? Do you know that he rose from the dead triumphantly, and that all who trust in him are grounded in his truth, have an expectation 
that is realized in a transformation that awaits us. And surely something of that is in the mind of the writer when he says, I want you to do all these things, because as you do these things, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Concluding a three-part message on citizenship, you're listening to Alistair Begg and Truth For Life Weekend. If you missed either of the previous messages, or if you'd like to share this study with a friend, you can find the complete audio online at truthforlife.org. In a minute, you'll hear a closing prayer from Alistair. But first, Alistair's story about Robert the Bruce is a perfect reminder of why church history is worth studying. In the lives of those who have come before us, we can find wonderful models of biblical living and challenging perspectives that are still as relevant now as they were centuries ago. That's why today we're excited to be featuring a book called The Glory of Grace. This is a collection of excerpts from the writings of the Puritans from the 16th and 17th centuries. The last 50 years have seen an increasing popularity in the writing of the Puritans. In fact, so many things have been published that it could be challenging to know where to begin. Well, if you're looking to understand more about this unique group of believers and why they're important for us today, this collection is an excellent introduction. This book covers 10 men and one woman who bravely lived for Christ through perilous times, including familiar names like John Bunyan and Anne Bradstreet, as well as others who will likely be new to you. With writings on topics like suffering, contentment, loss, assurance of salvation, daily discipleship, and much more, you'll be encouraged and challenged by the faith of these spiritual ancestors. We'd love to send you a copy of The Glory of Grace. You can learn how to request it when you visit us online at truthforlife.org. Again, that's truthforlife.org. Now, to wrap up today's message, here's Alistair Begg. Father, thank you that in the Lord Jesus Christ we have a Savior, a friend, a Lord, and a King. Thank you that when we are tempted to discouragement and to despair, when the affairs of life uh, threaten to undo us, as they often do, when cherished hopes and dreams, either for ourselves or for others, have not come to fruition in the way we had hoped and prayed, grant that we might look away from ourselves and from our circumstances to Christ our Lord. And when Satan tempts us to despair because we have not been all that we set out to be this week, because our Bible reading was really pretty stale. We chose to be silent rather than to speak. We really didn't make a much a go of it at all. And the evil one comes to us and says, and here you are, communion service. Oh, dear, oh, dear. Well, then we must retreat by advancing in the awareness that it is Jesus' blood and his righteousness that is our only standing before you, the living God, in all of time and through all of eternity. So bless your word to us, Lord, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm Bob Lapine, hoping you'll join us next weekend as we begin a series called History, Mystery, Divinity. Christmas is just around the corner, so we'll start preparing our hearts for the Advent season, reflecting on the amazing mystery of Christmas, God becoming man. Be sure to join us then. This program and the Bible teaching of Alistair Begg is furnished by Truth For Life. Where the learning is for living.